Hey, before we get into the show, I just want to remind you guys that I do a, a newsletter every Monday. Uh, it's a sales tip straight to your inbox. It's called Sales Ammo. You can sign up for free to receive these emails by going to artofsba.com and we'll put you on the email list. And then you can start getting these golden sales nuggets every single Monday to start your week. All right, now let's get on with the intro. Guys, the reviews are in. SBA lenders are calling CorpSmart the best due diligence firm in the industry. CorpSmart is a one-stop shop for all of your due diligence needs. And in SBA lending, there's a lot. Searches, filings, vehicles, you name it. I remember I brought a deal in one time that involved an airplane. My credit guy looked at me and he said, how are we going to go about perfecting a lien on an airplane? I said, I don't know. Call CorpSmart. If you're not already outsourcing your due diligence, one, you're probably wasting a lot of precious hours that you could be using to go find more loans, and two, you could make a mistake, especially if you're lending across multiple states because every state is different. If you're looking to streamline and get more efficient this year, this is an easy layup. They can connect right into your LOS so you can order your searches with the click of a button and they'll appear right in their placeholder. To discuss your due diligence needs, visit the CorpSmart website at www.corp-smart.com and you can let them know I sent you. Hello, and welcome back to the Art of SBA Lending Podcast. I'm your host, Ray Drew. Today, we're unpacking business acquisition underwriting standards, and we're going deep. The idea that we're financing business acquisitions, businesses started by someone decades ago that have grown to be profitable companies and putting 90% leverage on it to help a buyer with no experience in the business take over that business and tell us how they are going to improve that business is, well, it's something. These are high-risk transactions that require the utmost scrutiny, and yet we have a lot of lenders out here passing them out like their home loans in the early 2000s. Okay, that's an exaggeration, but my point is this. We as an industry have opened ourselves to more risk, and we should talk about it. People cite do what you do when talking about the increased defaults, but I think there are a lot of other factors at play that are far more impactful than that. Let me take you back to 2015 when the maximum advance rate was 75% on large goodwill transactions. 75% SBA, 15% seller note, 10% equity was a structure you'd see quite often. Well, all that went away in 2016 with a new SOP that allowed for up to 90% financing on business acquisitions. When that came out, I thought to myself, surely no one's going to finance business acquisitions at 90%. That's what we finance real estate at, and business acquisitions have way more risk and way less collateral. I was wrong. This was, by the way, a period of very low interest rates. So even with 90% leverage, every business acquisition that came across your desk cash flowed just fine. And sure enough, the market crept and crept up to the point where 90% financing became widely available. Now, at the time, I was at a shop that focused on real estate. We wanted two full years of 1-3 debt service coverage and a 10% seller note on pretty much every deal. On top of that, we wanted our collateral shortfall to be half a million dollars or less. And there were a bunch of shops like this at the time. Needless to say, I did not close many business acquisition loans with those underwriting standards. But after COVID, my, that prior shop I was at started getting more aggressive on business acquisition loans, deals with 5% down, even 0% cash injections in some cases. And all of a sudden, $3 million airballs didn't scare them as much. I think that's indicative of the market today. I think there's more shops than ever who are comfortable with large unsecured exposures. And I, I think there's a ton of shops approving deals at 90% financing with 10% injection, where only 5% is coming from the buyer and even less than that in some cases. So do I think we've gotten more aggressive with structures and more liberal with collateral? Yeah, of course. Now, does that translate to more risk? I'm sure it does. So is it worth it for SBA? That's the question. Well, the mission is access to capital for job creation. And when it comes to business acquisitions, the idea is to retain all of the jobs when a seller retires. Did this shift help that cause? No. What it did was help sellers get out of their businesses without holding that 10 to 15% seller note as often, which they were perfectly happy to do prior because they knew they had to because of the SBA's limitations. And buyers knew they needed at least 10%. Whereas now they think they only need 5% or less than that in some cases, and they're now able to buy bigger businesses as a result, which is great for them if that's what they want to do. But that doesn't really help the SBA's mission because there isn't a shortage of buyers. 
quite the opposite, actually. All right, now let's shift to the buyer profiles for a sec. Back in my day, if you wanted to buy a business in a certain industry, you had to have experience in that industry. I know that sounds crazy. Um, that's totally out the window today. None of these buyers have direct industry experience. And here's why. The idea of buying a business is no longer a secret. There is social media, podcasts, different groups out there, all promoting this idea that you can quit your job and buy a business and build generational wealth. And I've got to be honest, it's pretty compelling. The only problem is none of these buyers have ever owned any business, and they're taking a calculated risk by making a leap and buying a business that they know nothing about for a chance at the American dream. And I do not blame them for that. Perhaps they were managing a division at a company. Maybe they were an early stage employee at a startup that grew really big. You know, Maybe they got laid off from tech. Whatever it is, these people are smart. I think the days of needing direct industry experience are over. However, I don't think that means SBA is taking on more risk. I think we've wised up actually. This is essentially mini private equity and private equity people tend to be pretty damn successful and they're buying up plumbing and HVAC companies, not because they're tradesmen, but because of the characteristics of the business, recurring revenue, recession proof, low customer concentration, fragmented markets, et cetera. This is perhaps the biggest shift happening in the world of SBA business acquisitions that no one is talking about. This self-fund search model has become wildly popular. In 2018, a guy named Walker Dybel published a book called Buy Then Build, which effectively laid out why buying a business is a great path to entrepreneurship and building wealth. And the book provides the playbook on how to do it. And it's created an army of people wanting to buy businesses using SBA financing. There are boot camps, accelerators, communities, gurus, podcasts, all of these resources for this community. Banks are creating verticals for these search fund type deals. There's even an investor community that's starting to come together with pretty standard terms for investing in these SBA acquisition type deals. And many of the deals are structured with investor capital as the injection. So you have a 10 to 15% injection, but only a tiny fraction of that could be coming from the guarantor. It wouldn't be uncommon to see a $5 million SBA loan being made to someone with like a $250,000 net worth who's injecting $50,000 of their own money and the rest coming from investors. These guys are, are young, but they're super smart and they've got MBAs from the top schools and they know how to do a deal. But often they're pretty light on hands-on management and operational experience. So I'd be very curious to see how this particular profile of deal is performing and is going to perform in the future. Now, fast forward to today, interest rates are damn near double where they were when SBA changed that advance rate for business acquisitions, and the default rate's starting to creep up. So the question is, where is it going to peak? It's still relatively low, but trending up. I believe it's somewhere in the mid twos right now, with the caveat that business acquisitions are only 20% or so of the 7A portfolio. Now, I would suspect that in the most recent few years, we've put a lot more unsecured or undersecured paper onto the SBA portfolio. So I want to pay attention to that charge off rate too. But the big question is what's driving those increases and are more liberal business acquisition underwriting standards playing a part? Let's bring in our panel of Art of SBA contributors to break it all down. We have with us today, Charles Rowe, president of Velocity SBA, Kay Anderson, senior vice president at Live Oak Bank, and Brian Carlson, SBA Managing Director at Mission Valley Bank. Folks, thanks for being here and welcome to the show. Thank Charles, you. I'm going to go to you with this one because you've been doing this a lot longer than me. And I'm curious, is my perception of what's going on with the business acquisition underwriting standards valid? I think so. Um, you know, I think the industry has seen a lot more share of business acquisition opportunities over the past uh, several years. Certainly the, um, uh, the changing of the SOP and allowance of uh, uh, down to 10% injection feel that. But I think also in the recent years, when I say recent years, probably you know past five, six, seven years or so, um, you've really seen an increase on business acquisition opportunities, making up the 7A lending space. And really over the past several years, I think it's even accelerated further just because um, in the 7A space where you used to see quite a bit of uh, maybe real estate lending, 
but with the high interest rate environment, um, those deals have uh, you know gone over to the 504 lending side for lower rate structure or even conventional lending side of things. So I think you're seeing a bigger mix overall driven by 90% uh, 90% guarantee or 90% I'm sorry um, uh, loan um, to cost or loan to value in an acquisition scenario as well as the higher interest rate environment. And I think for the most part, a lot of lenders have figured out a way to really uh, get an understanding, better understanding. As you said in the monologue, there's been lenders such as ourselves historically have been more real estate focused and we're seeing more and more opportunity in the business acquisition side um, due to the factors that I just mentioned. So, you know, we have been navigating through it and I think, you know, it's going to be um, kind of, you know, part of the 7A program, I think, more and more. Um, especially um, in this rate environment, if we don't see a significant drop or a change. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I think is, um, yes, higher potential risk, but it is needed. And, uh, you know, we'll continue to navigate through it for okay, us. Okay, good. So then this topic is timely um, as we're moving more, as we think that business acquisitions are going to become more and more prominent you know, within the 7A uh, ecosystem. So, okay, I'm going to go to you next here. Do you think the way some banks out there are underwriting business acquisitions is a threat to the sustainability of the program? I don't really. Um, when we started Live Oak Bank in 2008, um, we started this bank with the assumption that cash flow pays us back, not collateral. And that has been our method of operation ever since then. Granted, some of our industry verticals here in Wilmington are projection-based deals and are real estate involved, but for change of ownership business acquisition deals, I talk to lenders every day of the week in my current role, and I would say that um, for deal sizes up to about a million five, most lenders are all in on the um, collateral light deals, business acquisition deals. But once you get above that, most lenders I talk to require that there's hard real estate in the deal. Live Oak, on the other hand, doesn't look at business acquisitions that way. We are 100% based, our decisions are based on historical cash flow and um, the sponsorship of the individual that's applying to us for the loan. So we'll go up to nine million dollars on a 7a loan with the para pursue loan and actually historically can show in our portfolio that the larger loan sizes have a much better um, repayment rate than the smaller loans do well that's so incredible we, we think our, our cumulative loss rate at this bank i know a lot of people think we're the kind of the renegade lenders out there you know doing all these business acquisition loans with no real estate required in the deal or where the real estate's really just an incidental part of the transaction. In reality, um, our cumulative loss rate since we started the bank, I think is about 0.67%. So our portfolio quality is pristine, in my opinion. Yeah, you, you guys are beating industry averages um, by mm -hmm. a lot, which kind of proves out the model to a certain extent. So that's awesome. Right. Um, Brian, have you noticed a shift in the market over the last, you know, five to seven years in terms of needing to get more aggressive on business acquisitions to maintain volume, given, you know, the, the real estate stuff drying up a little bit in these last couple of years? You know, I, I think there has been some shift, but it still seems like there's plenty of business out there. Um, so we, we, of course, do CRE loans and we do SBA business acquisition loans. Um, and I agree with Kay. I mean, when you look at credit, and underwriting these, um, and you factor in an SBA guarantee, the guarantee, you know, you, you're not going to lend on, you know, personally, we won't lend to people that don't have experience. Um, they're going to have to show us, you know, that they they have the capability to run this. And secondly, um, you know, if you don't have cash flow, if you don't have good credit from the borrower, the guarantee doesn't really help you. I mean, it obviously insures you, but you're still going to take a loss. Where it really helps you is it subsidizes the collateral and uh, in effect gives you 75% collateralization for the loan. That's where I think it, it comes into play. And, and we do a fair amount of um, business acquisition loans. The, um, and like, hey, I mean, we've, we've only had one problem loan in three and a half years. So um, you know, we haven't had issues with the portfolio. Interesting. Okay.
If you've been a fan of the show for a while, then you know one of my favorite companies to work with is Rapid Business Plans. Last year alone, their business plans helped facilitate over $600 million in government guaranteed lending. They're on track to beat that this year. More and more small business lenders and their borrowers are relying on Rapid to help with the business plan, projections, and assumptions because their team goes the extra mile to ensure everything is done fast and done right. And that helps streamline the process. They're great at export business plans, by the way, which are critically important at protecting that 90% guarantee. Rapid also offers feasibility studies, which tells you if the project is, well, feasible. I would recommend these for any large startup loan because it protects you and it protects the borrower and helps you get more good deals done. Go to rapidbusinessplans.com to set up your Get Acquainted call today. Find out why so many top producing BDOs recommend Rapid to their small business borrowers. We're going to leave a link in the show notes just for our Art of SBA listeners. Now let's get back to the show. Let me go, let me toss this over to Kay here. So does it surprise you? Because we talked about that, um, those changes in advance rates. Um, what was it now? Nine years ago. Um, does it surprise you when the SBA gives us more freedom and all these banks end up offering more aggressive structures, like basically inching towards the most aggressive structure possible under the SOP? Does it surprise me? No, it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, we certainly... Um, are willing to follow the SOP guidelines as far as equity is concerned and things like that on these deals. And um, again, we look to the historical cash flow of the business um, and don't believe that a borrower should have to put every last penny they have in equity and be strapped on day one when they step into the business to manage it. So we ensure that they have sufficient working capital in the 7A loan, as well as a supplemental line of credit, whether it's express or conventional, just to be sure that they're set up properly on day one. And clearly our focus in these transactions is on the borrower's readiness to step in and manage the business. That's where we spend all of our time since we don't focus on the collateral. Mm, interesting. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good point because uh, I know a lot of banks out there that have almost the opposite view of working capital. I worked at one mm -hmm. like many years ago when I was learning and and they were like focused on working capital sort of more in like a limit our exposure. Don't, you know, give them too much type of thing, which is obviously like shooting yourself in the foot. So, right. That's we believe that also. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're one of the few banks in the country that requires that the seller provide monthly bank statements to us because we want to track the cash in the business on a monthly basis so that we can adequately um, provide for in the use of proceeds working capital in the term loan. So then Charles, how, where does collateral play in all this? Because the SBA guarantee is there for a reason. Are banks taking on more risk by opening the door to big airball loans? Or are banks just finally coming around to the spirit of the program, which is not to turn down deals just simply just because an applicant doesn't have enough collateral to secure it? Yeah. No, I think obviously, I think every lender would appreciate collateral um, in any kind of lending, um, but doesn't mean that it's absolutely necessary. In the case of most business acquisition loans, I mean, you don't see a lot of collateral. Um, and that is something that we navigate through. Um, having said that, I do think, you know, there are unique challenges to underwriting a business acquisition loan. And as Brian said, too, for us, and, um, you know, Kay, I think, is alluding to it, too, is that, you know, for us, yeah, it's all about the cash flow, right? And uh, just because you have a business that had historical three years of cash flow doesn't mean that it's going to continue under new management. So we do spend, for a business acquisition loan, rather than spending time looking at collateral, whether it exists or not, um, it's really most of our time is spent on the, the borrower, uh, that's coming in and their background, uh, are they able to continue the success of that business and generate the, the sufficient cash flow of the business? And, you know, when it comes to working capital post-close liquidity, obviously that's important. We don't want to lend to a business and be able to not have assurance that they're going to have enough, right, uh, operating working capital um, to be able to sustain the operation in the initial months or 
you know, initial years. So we do look at that carefully, but there's also a balance, right, on how much working capital is really needed. You don't want to uh, have a borrower be overladen with debt um, more than what they should be having. So um, it's a, it's really a cash flow, continuation of cash flow, and, you know, the working capital position that they're going to have day one going forward, that's really about 90, 95% of the underwrite for us on a business acquisition deal. Yeah, I, I always tell folks, I can't give you more working capital than you need, but I also really can't give you less than what you need. You kind of have to mm -hmm. do the math and come up with that specific number of what the business actually right. needs. Right. Um, it's almost like it's a science and an art. So Brian, you know, seller notes is always a hot topic. And I think everyone agrees seller notes are a great risk mitigation tool for a change of ownership transactions. Many bankers and many buyers will not do a deal without one. But how much do you think a 10% seller note changes a seller's behavior, considering they're still cashing out a multi-million dollar exit at closing? So good question. I don't know that it, it makes that much difference. Obviously, uh, if you go less than 10% borrower down, um, that portion of any seller carry has to put on, be put on full standby. And so you're, that's not too attractive to sellers. But, you know, sometimes you wonder, is the, you know, is the price of the business somehow inflated by 10%? And, and so it's just kind of make-believe seller carry. But ultimately, I, I don't know that that's, that's going to make a difference. Certainly, the continuity of, of management and making sure that um, there is someone there to um, kind of walk the buyer through, you know, all the processes that, that are there. Uh, Certainly franchise lending makes that simpler because the franchise in effect is doing that. You know, the, the seller carry in of itself doesn't, doesn't do that much for you. I think the, um, uh, I think the, you know, having, you know, I'd rather have some collateral than, um, than the seller carry, you know, some real estate collateral. Does any, does, do either of you guys have a different take on that? Kay or Charles? Yeah, we do, we do not require seller notes at Live Oak um, unless they're required in order to facilitate the total use of proceeds. So, for example, if you have an $11 million transaction that you're looking at and we're willing to loan nine um, and the seller or buyer has to come in with 10 percent, then obviously there's a gap and the seller would have to carry back a note. We look at it from the point of view solely of what's the best interest of the buyer. So if the seller is willing to carry back a note, even then, we look at the terms and the conditions of the seller note and make sure it's in the best interest of our customer um, and make our decisions based on that. But we do not require seller notes in our transactions for that reason. Charles, it's was usually that the shorter term or something like that. Right. Charles, was, is that a shift? Because I was trained that a seller note is almost like a necessity for a business acquisition because it promotes transparency from the seller's end and then post closing it keeps the seller's feet to the fire in a way you know to to help make sure they're there in case something comes up yeah i don't know if it's a shift I can't speak for others but for me and and you know velocity sba uh, the seller note is is not required first of all um, but it does help in certain areas and you know for a lender perspective and also from a borrower perspective, like Kay said, you know, if you have a committed seller who's willing to put up a sizable seller carry note, and with that, there's going to be some tie-in and there's going to be some continuity. There's going to be a seller who's successfully operated this business, who's going to continue to possibly watch over that business, assist the new borrower. So, yeah, you know, that gives a lender um, some comfort level, and I think that helps. Um, but is it necessary? No, because again, going back to what I said earlier, really for us, you know, everything is really the, the heavy underwrite is on the borrower and their capability to manage the business successfully with or without, right, a seller carry note tied um, uh, to that transaction. Interesting. Well, it's so funny. I mean, yeah, sometimes I guess when you're um, taught things a certain way, um, it's just drilled in your brain. And that's why this conversation is helpful because it allows us to get all of our training and experience, you know, out there so that people can sort of take it, digest it and make up their own minds. Um, so that's awesome. Okay. I'm going to go to you with this one here. Cause obviously no one wants a deal to go bad. Um, 
that typically ends in a personal bankruptcy for a borrower. So they have every incentive to avoid it. So when it comes to skin in the game, putting in 1% versus 5% versus 10%, does it really matter? Does having your own cash in the deal change your behavior or mindset as a borrower? As a borrower, um, we certainly want as a bank for everybody to have some skin in the game, right? It's defined differently based on the industry type around here. But um, from the borrower's point of view, I think it does change their perspective if they've got some cash in the deal. And how much is nebulous, right? We certainly follow the SOP and are willing to allow borrowers to put in um, 5% in cash and 5% held by the um, seller on full standby. We require for the term of the loan, not for the 24 months that's allowed. But we do think it does change the borrower's mindset to have something in the deal. Yeah. A lot of the times we look at their personal financial statement and quite honestly see what kind of liquidity they have, right? Um, you know, 5% for some people is nothing. It's a drop in the bucket and wouldn't psychologically impact them. For others, it's a lot of money. That's so an interesting point. That. Yeah. So if you're, if you're qualified to be buying a business for some reason, that's like 5 million bucks, but you are just putting in 50,000 and that's, you know, half your life savings or, or even more, yeah. that's substantial for you, even though it's only, it, it may is. only be 1% of the project. That's right. Okay. Well, here, here's, here's a little twist here. So Charles, many of these deals are getting referred by the business broker who is hired by the seller to sell the business at the highest valuation possible. So we're getting our business from that person in many cases, that business broker, that listing broker, and we're paying them a referral fee in many cases. Do you, do you see any conflict there? I mean, I think just because it's a business, um, brokerage versus let's say real estate brokerage, right? Um, they play a critical role in um, providing a service to the seller and the buyer. We do not think that just because there is a business broker involved, do we doubt the transaction? Obviously that's a natural course evolution of these businesses that you're gonna have some sort of a brokerage representation. And for the most part, We've never really had any issues with that. Obviously, we all go ahead and do our own valuation. We do third-party valuations uh, to make sure. And, and when you do enough of these transactions, and certainly um, you become kind of a, somewhat of an expert in what these you know, values, um, you can pretty much kind of tell from the very initial stage. If you hear a number and you hear the, you know, the industry, the revenue, the, just the basic four or five figures, you can kind of scratch your head sometimes and go, how's that value coming out, right? So I think, um, you know, for me, it's um, getting to know the transaction. Every deal is going to be a little bit different. You can have the same business in the same industry, but, you know, you could have different valuations coming out, right? Um, it's not just a cookie cutter, like a single family mortgage kind of valuation, if you will. Um, so there's a lot more complexity to it. But I think uh, for a lot of lenders who, who are involved in acquisition, you do become an expert. You do have vertical expertise. Um, I, I don't really look at um, uh, the fact that there's an intermediary brokerage uh, involved really impacts the transaction negatively, or we look at it in a uh, more of a you know uh, kind of a you know riskier lens, if you will. Right. I agree with Charles um, here at Live Oak. I would say I'm guessing a little bit here, but on business acquisition, change of ownership deals, I would say we use. A great percentage of our deals come from business brokers, and of those, I would say we maybe pay on half of the half of the time we pay broker fees. So it's it's significant, um, but we believe that you can't manage what you don't measure, and so we track every single broker by loan default, by um, volume of transactions, a number of different measures, so we can quickly see in our system, whether a certain brokerage firm is bringing us high quality transactions that um, don't default or vice versa and take action accordingly. A lot of the nerds that are that like to watch this podcast are probably salivating at all the data you have over there. Yeah. Okay. With the volume you've been doing. That's, that's amazing. So Brian, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but I get calls every day from people who have no business buying a business trying to buy a business, no money, no experience. Social media is marketing, uh, buying a business like their fix and flip, get rich quick schemes. Uh, 
Do you see that as a threat to the program at all? No, I mean, I've, I've been in SBA lending about 35 years, and it seems like you always have, you know, people that'll reach out um, and, you know, you can quickly determine that, you know, this person really isn't qualified or doesn't have any, can't really bring anything to the, to the deal. And even getting back to your question about business brokers, you know, we don't see any, well, there is an interest there, but it's not a real conflict because we underwrite the transactions carefully and, and, you know, that's no matter what you've got people out there, whether it's a real estate agent or whatever that have a vested interest in getting this deal done. And so really as the banker, you have to, you know, do a competent job underwriting. And, and that gets back to, you know, you know, beyond the down payment or a seller carry, you know, is there enough liquidity and net worth uh, on the borrower side to sustain them? Um, you know, should, you know, sh should they have troubles getting out of the gate and transitioning into the business? I agree with you, though, Ray. Um, I was talking to John Randall, who manages our what you would call our BDO team. We called them generalists before we got on this call. And I said, so what's the latest? And he said, well, he said, I'll tell you right now. He said, everybody in this country thinks they're a buyer. He said, even the guy that sits in his mom's basement, you know, who doesn't have any cash, thinks he's a qualified buyer. And what that's what we see happening under these kinds of scenarios is that those individuals will, you know, end in, enter into LOIs with, um, you know, with sellers on deals um, for transactions where they don't have financing in place or the cash to back them up. So there's a lot of um, going back and forth because of that, because they're not qualified. They haven't qualified themselves financially to enter into those LOIs. And then they have to get renegotiated um, usually downwards from there. Mm -hmm. So we, we're seeing a lot of that now. Mm -hmm. But you guys are like, you know, Kevlar, this, this podcast is dripping in prudence. Um, prudence, <laughs> is that a word? Um, so am I overstating the issue? Are we good or are we headed for trouble, Charles? Because I don't want there to be an issue and all of a sudden there's concerns with the level of risk being taken and that's when bad things happen. Yeah, I mean, I think just from... Um, if you just look at the product itself and the fact that um, there's, you know, minimal collateral, let's just say, to fall back on, right? And with the changes, there's minimal skin in the game in a lot of these transactions. So you have to be really careful what you put on your books. Um, at the same time, we've seen a lot more lenders uh, venture into this space, I think. Um, and you hope that they're all doing a good job underwriting. But you know, if you just kind of say, hey, if you peel back the layers, I mean, is that a riskier loan? Absolutely. Um, it's it's compared to a real estate uh, back transaction. So does that mean potentially that there's some hiccup in the economy that could impact these small businesses? Could that possibly um, start some sort of a trigger and you'll just start seeing a lot more delinquencies and defaults in the SBA portfolio? I mean, yes, um, but I, 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 I don't, you know, I can't predict the future, but I do know that there's, you know, more lenders and more, I guess, mix of business acquisition activity than in the past in the 7A program. Mm-hmm. It's getting really competitive out here um, with the business acquisition. Every BDO in town wants to be a business acquisition specialist. Do you think it's possible that competition can drive banks to take on more risk? I think it, it's possible that that can happen initially. Um, and I think that lenders sometimes do a good job, BDOs in particular. I was one for 20 years, I know, um, can convince credit to um expand their parameters a little bit. Um, that usually works until the first thing goes bump in the night and then they constrict again. So maybe initially I would say yes, competitors can be driven to fund or look at business acquisition deals okay. in a little bit more aggressive way. All right, Brian, take us home here. So if there is a problem, isn't it just gonna correct itself? Because by and large, most lenders approach business acquisition lending with prudence. Um, but there's always a few bad actors and they've probably been shielded to a certain extent in recent years with all the liquidity and COVID relief and the record low interest rates, but that's all drying up. 
and the rates are at all time highs. So won't the, the most aggressive shop simply blow up and stop doing what they've been doing? I'm not so sure. The, um, the one thing is that this is a, a profitable business. And obviously, if you're, if you're selling, making premiums, um, you know, you can afford a higher loan loss provision. But ultimately, if you're, if you're a federal a regulated bank, the regulators aren't going to tolerate, um, you know, a high level of problem loans. At some point, they're going to step in and say, all right, you guys uh, you know, need to change your credit policy. So I think, I think there are kind of safeguards in the system that way, Ray. You know, what I see out there is that I think most lenders are fairly prudent on kind of down payments and, um, you know, essentially looking at deals realistically. And, and, and like you said earlier, I think most, you know, as the loan size gets larger, their tolerance for unsecured uh, exposure becomes more of a concern. And so a lot of those kind of airball loans get limited to uh, smaller sizes. Right. True. Good point. So as we wrap things up here, guys, do you have any points that you want to make um, before we sign off on this? You know, again, the idea is focusing on business acquisition, underwriting standards, really looking at the last 10 years and the trends and kind of where we're going. And um, is there anything anyone would like to add to that? I think at Live Oak, um, we are absolutely still committed to um, the way that we loan money and business acquisition deals. Um, historical cash flow and the credit characteristics and the management characteristics of the buyer um, are how we make our decisions. So I guess said another way on those types of transactions, throwing a piece of collateral against a deal is never going to convert a mediocre cash flowing deal to a yes decision at Live Oak. Well said. Well, panel, thank you so much for uh, stopping by the show and lending your valuable insights. Until next time, ta-ta. All right, that's it for this week's episode. If you want more SBA content, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter and check out our sister shows, SBA Today and The Video Show. We'll leave a link in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode of The Art of SBA Lending. Ta-ta.